अच्छा जी सलाम वालेकुम दोज ऑफ मी थैंक यू नवीद डोंट नो मी आई एम अ कार्डियोलॉजिस्ट आई प्रैक्टिस एट नेशनल हॉस्पिटल लाहौर मैं प्राइवेट प्रैक्टिस में ही हूँ वी डू हैव अ फेलोशिप प्रोग्राम देयर नाउ तो व्हेन दे अप्रोच मी आज थे मिस देर इज एनी स्पेसिफिक थिंग दैट वी नीड टू टॉक अबाउट हाइपर तो उन्होंने मुझे जो ऑडियंस का मिक्स बताया आई डिसाइडेड विल कीप द टॉक वेरी सिंपल एंड ट्राई टू फिनिश इन 15 20 मिनट्स एंड देन ओपन द हाउस फॉर क्वेश्चन एंड आंसर एंड थिंक द क्यू एंड ए विल हेल्प एवरीबडी मोर अभी वाइल वी वर सिटिंग हेयर कपल ऑफ फिजिशन अप्रोच दस विद ब्लड प्रेशर इशूज एंड क्वेरीज एंड आई थिंक दैल बी मोर अप्रोप्रिएट so uh, hypertension is a big healthcare issue uh, this is from back in uh, 2000 uh, even uh, at that time the, it was like one in five patients were supposed to be hypertensive and i think it's projected to be about one in four or even in some places one in five and certain parts of uh, africa and asia including russia are expected to be as much as every other patient may be a hypertensive there so uh, 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 so one in five uh so 9.6 million deaths about 10 million deaths per year that's a very large number of people who die globally because of the hypertension so 50% of heart disease stroke and heart failure from hypertension and about 13% of deaths are contributed to this disease this is patients who are uncontrolled and uh, hypertensive um so uh the this is from lancet back in 2005 so in 2000 uh, it was about 26% that the numbers that i showed you and it's projected by 2025 it would be about 29% so very significant increase almost like one in third uh, patients and whether it's a male or a female or overall the numbers are very comparable you know so it is a big issue it's going to be a, almost like a pandemic kind of a stage people will develop hypertension and especially this winter i don't know if you guys have noticed in your clinical practice it's a big issue this year so the highest prevalence will be in the developing countries in Af- africa and asia as i said and they almost contribute to about 75% of the patient the hypertensive patients and we are one of them this again is a very famous slide most of us would have seen and this is from dr livington uh, this was a meta analysis of about 1 million adults from 61 prospective trials published in lancet about 20 years ago and uh, long behold still after 20 years i think this still stays true because because the disease is increasing so this tells you that how much it contributes to the overall morbidity and mortality so 2 mm decrease in mean blood pressure decreases 7% reduction in risk of ischemic heart disease mortality and about 10% reduction in the risk of stroke mortality and we are not talking about like a 10000 20000 patient study we are talking about 12.7 million person here about a million patients that have were a part of these different trials that this meta analysis reviewed this again is another slide from the same meta analysis analysis in this which it showed that the patients who had different blood pressure readings and how the mortality cv mortality increases so once you go from 115 to 175 to 135 by 85 it goes up by 2x and then once 155 by 95 it's 4x and once it's like 175 105 which is like resist, uh, uncontrolled hypertension or hypertensive emergency numbers and it stays persistently high it's about 10x so you will look at these numbers to be very benign like 135 by 85 it's okay it's fairly within the normal range but just imagine when you compare from this which kind of both falls within the one is the normal bp one is it falls in the elevated bp range but the mortality does make a difference you know and it's uh, twice the mortality and how does this happen usually this is target organ damage as we know the blood pressure wherever the artery goes the pressure goes and it uh, exposes that organ to it we have experts from all the specialties so we know that chronic kidney disease is a big uh, major uh, issue uh, it's on the health economics uh, peripheral vascular disease retinopathy hemorrhagic strokes and then uh, cardiomyopathy developing lvf all of these are from hypertension now the risk for hypertension is advancing age most of the people who walk on the face of the earth will develop primary hypertension very few people will be left who will not be developing it age sex the se- male sex and postmenopausal women and then fem- history of cardiovascular disease sedentary lifestyle and psychosocial stresses and other risk factors that is having uh, smoking high cholesterol low fruit uh, consumption high salt diet obesity and weight gain and diabetes hyperlipidemia all contribute towards developing hypertension also now treatment uh, we'll quickly look at the goals uh, which will be kind of very simplified these days and then what is the algorithm which includes lifestyle modification and basically what is the pharmacotherapy which again you know uh, we'll have a couple of slides about 
about uh, combination therapy and then we'll open the floor. So goals of therapy essentially is one, two, two numbers that you absolutely have to remember is 140 by 90 and 130 by 80. So most of these guidelines, either JNC8 will come, they'll change number one year and next year International Society of Hypertension will come and it will change and then the ACC will come and ESC will. But I think at the end of the day, you just remember these two numbers. Ideally, the BP is 120 by 80. But if we apply that, I think maybe half of the world will end up on the uh, hypertension medication. But for the general population, 140 by 90 and patients who have chronic kidney disease, diabetes, heart failure, or uh, ischemic heart disease, or LVF, then 130 by 80 is the target number. Again, as I said, JNC8 this year has been liberal with certain age, about 150 by 90. And after that, it's 140 by 90 that they have said. Uh, this is from 2017 ACC AHA. Again, the thing that I mentioned, normal BP essentially is 120 by 80. It's not less than 130 by 80. It's 120 by 80. Anything between 120 and 130 is considered elevated BP. It's not normal, but it's not classified as hypertension at that stage. Your risk starts, you get to start exposing to the risk at that time. Now, stage one is 130 to 40 and 80 to 90. And then stage two is anything more than 140. And then hypertensive crises, as I mentioned, was systolic greater than 180 or diastolic more than 120. Or if the numbers are less, you start having some target organ damage or you have some symptoms. Um, in this, there is a subtitle here, and I think this is very important because all of us who are taking care of the patient, we get a phone call saying the BP is You are afraid that you, how can you talk on the phone if your blood pressure is 60 millimeters? They are talking about the diastolic blood pressure. And once you ask them, they say, my BP is 150 by 60. So it's essentially the highest, higher number that you have to treat. So it's not that uh, all of us know that for perfusion, we need a pulse pressure, which is a difference of systolic minus diastolic. One third of pulse pressure plus diastolic pressure is the one that you need. So, you, you, so, we, have to be, uh, so we have to treat the high, highest number. And all of us, uh, people who will age, they will, the pulse pressure will continue to increase, you know, as the arteries compliance decreases, the stiffness increases. So this is important that they have put it in the, their slide that uh, definitely the higher number, whether systolic or diastolic is the one that should be treated. So we have added a slide from GNC, ACC, HA, so we need our other colleagues from ESC and ISH to be shown there also. So we have added a slide from them also, though they are very similar that they would say that uh, for target population, we'll focus on the optimal care uh, for both, the, uh, both of them. Again, the number for them is also 140 by 90. For diagnosis, they are okay with office BP, or you can do home or do an ambulatory blood pressure monitoring also. And again, the patients with CV disease, CKD, uh, uh, would require a, a risk stratification and a control of blood pressure and the treatment therapy kind of stays the same um, if you have uh, you'll go for the lifestyle modification whatever guidelines you use and essentially when the patient is grade one hypertension and if the lifestyle modification doesn't work you'll start with the hyper uh, uh, blood pressure medication so again you have a single office blood pressure it's greater than 135 by 85 or 130 by 80 the plan would be that patient goes home check with ambulatory blood pressure monitoring or you do an ambulatory blood pressure monitoring if it stays less than 130 by 80 85 then you are fine and uh, the guidelines would say that you check the blood pressure then after a year or so uh, again this is again little different western hemisphere it's little different than here uh, the guidelines come from that part here getting a blood pressure checked is very easy by a physician also there is very difficult to get in to see a doctor or get into the er to see them also um, so, uh, what are the life? Uh, so, so once you have the diagnosis of hypertension, what would that include? You should have a very good uh, history and physical exam. The history should that they should be excluding any drug-induced hypertension. There are certain medication that can increase the blood pressure. You evaluate them for our organ damage, whether it's a left ventricular hypertrophy, there's a retinopathy, there is any kidney disease that has developed or not, and then you definitely assess their cardiovascular risk uh, calculator by checking um, a certain. Uh, you can use an ESC calculator or an ASCVD calculator and then definitely you look for screen them for anything for secondary hypertension if the patient is very uh, young. Certain tests you should always do, you should do a urine dipstick, you should do an electrolytes and you should do a renal function test definitely. That helps you with the secondary hypertension and target organ damage also. For other risk stratification, do check a lipid profile, 12 lead ECG will help for left ventricular hypertrophy and then if you suspect a secondary hypertension then all those fancy tests needs to be done for metanephrines or aldosterone or renin levels. So lifestyle modification, what is essentially a lifestyle modification? So essentially all the risk factors that I mentioned earlier 
are the ones that needs to be addressed. So person needs to stop smoking, a regular exercise, losing weight, salt reduction, healthy diet and drinks and lower stress and sleep, uh, uh, sleeping well or sleep apnea. If that is there, it's one of the major causes of hypertension actually these days. So uh, quick word, diet, DASH diet is the one which is recommended by different guidelines. It's about changes, some number changes between 2 and 1.5 grams in 24 hours and that's about one uh, the amount of salt in one teaspoon. Uh, that is the amount of salt that's recommended to be consumed in 24 hours. As I said, it goes from 2 grams to 1.5 grams. Average American diet is about 3 grams in 24 hours. So definitely, uh, most of the diets would have uh, more than that. Exercise guidelines would say 30 to 45 minutes, 30 minutes, 7 days a week, 45 minutes, about uh, 5 days a week. And it involves about 5 to 6 mets, which is about a good brisk walk where you get a little short of breath. Weight loss, salt reduction, all of these things definitely contribute. They may shave off about a one or two millimeter but once you add all of these things that can shave off about 10 to uh, 10 millimeter or even 15 millimeter of mercury off the blood pressure reading so uh, you do lifestyle modification and you see if the blood pressure is at goal if they are not at goal then essentially you can pick up any medication that you want unless and until patient has a compelling indication compelling indication are uh, uh, chronic kidney disease patient has cardiomyopathy uh, patient has ischemic heart disease so then you pick up uh, one of the different agents. So the agents are either ACE or ARB or calcium channel blocker or a thiazide diuretic. Now if a cardiac patient, most of them end up being on beta blockers or ACE inhibitors or ARNEs these days if the EF is low. Again, if the chronic kidney disease patient and you want to add an ACE inhibitor, then you pick up the agent which has a compelling uh, indication. Otherwise, any one uh, medication depending on patient's compliance or any side effects could be uh, given to the patient. So blood pressure monitoring should be uh, recommended and then if the goal is achieved within three months and there is no side effects, you continue with a long-term management, otherwise you change them. Uh, now we're going to switch gears and we're going to talk a little bit about this combination pill uh, since we, uh, Amlodipine and Melsartan um, 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 uh, people have sponsored this talk. So I think we'll talk about it and it's a, it's a, it's a valid issue in our current guidelines and uh, where the patient compliance is. So these are very important trials, life value ASCOT. So 80% of the population required at least two drugs to reach the blood pressure goals. And this again, uh, if you look at it, this is not uh, uh, Pakistan, India, Bangladesh. This is England, Sweden, Germany, Spain. And this is back from about 20 years ago. So uh, quite a bit of population did not reach the goal here. And this is, uh, these are like some of these Sweden and these companies are uh, like companies where the healthcare system is, the government provides medication and all the healthcare. So quite a bit of population, the blood pressure was not the goal was not achieved in these cases so it's not that it's us only that is the issue so compliance not getting to the goals is an issue in there that part of the world also this again is a very famous slide i don't know i'm pretty sure most of us have seen it this again these are all very landmark trials you know all had trial ascot ukpds abcd renal heart mdrd and uh, if you see the average number of uh, antihypertensive medication used in these trials actually all had was the one which has the lowest number with the chlorothaladone was used is about 2.5. So 2.5 agents are essentially used in most of these trials. You know, it's very rare that you'll find that the patients who are adequately controlled would be on single agent. Now, having said that, it's not that all the patients will require two agents, but it looks like in real life data, patients do require two, two and a half agents uh, on an average to be controlled by the blood pressure. And again, this is the same uh, data, but presented in a different way. You see this UKPDS, ABCD, MDRD, and all these important trials and this is the number of the drugs. So you would see that a number almost falls between two and three. And some of these trials, like these MDRD and ASK trial, there are between three and four agents that were given to achieve the target hypertensive. This again is another slide that shows that uh, the compliance is a big issue. So this is year one and this is male and female and very comparable that, you know, it's not that males are more compliant than females, uh, that it's 100%. And by the time you reach year 10, uh, the compliance goes down to almost about 40%, whether it's a male or a female patient. So as the time goes by, people do start stopping medication and that becomes a big issue when you're taking a whole lot more pills. And same thing, you know, uh, for the fixed dose or a combination 
combination versus monotherapy, it definitely makes a big difference in controlling the blood pressure. The response is 90% here and 30%. And I think compliance plays a big role. Also, when you combine them, uh, the, the pathophysiologically, it works well. And next few slides will show that. And again, this was a small study published 15 years ago. They're giving patient amlodipine 10 milligrams and valsartan 160. And individually, they are decreasing the blood pressure by 17 and 15 millimeters of mercury. And when you combine them, essentially, the pill stays the same. It's a cumulative effect that it decreases the blood pressure to 23 millimeters of mercury. And they do have complementary effects also from the, si from the side effect standpoint. So uh, we know that arterial hypertension results from what? Constricted blood vessels, high resistance. Now, calcium channel blockers uh, uh, results in uh, arterial vasodilatation. So what happens is usually it causes for us for the most time patients to develop edema because there's an absent venodilatation part. So you are dilating the arteries and then the veins are not getting dilated and sometimes reduction in blood pressure. Most of us know that the RAS system does get stimulated or gets activated once the kidney perfusion goes down a little bit. Now, once you combine a calcium channel blocker with a RAS inhibition, the, what happens is that once it inhibits the RAS, so that helps you from that standpoint. And then once you have a little bit of a venodilatation part, the edema part goes down a little bit. So again, uh, the slide shows in a different way that we have calcium channel blockers where these two things have gone up, RAS and SNS, like system, uh, your sympathetic nervous system, and ARBs help you with that. Uh, this was, again, a very provocative study, very small study, where they measured the ankle foot volume. I uh, don't know how they did it, maybe by measuring with the inchy tape. But if you give patients about amlodipine 10 milligrams, and we see this a lot in Pakistan pop, uh, population here. I never had this edema problem in uh, practicing in America that much as it is here. 23% had ankle foot volume increase. It was a 23% increase. But when you give the same amlodipine with a velsartan, that is a combination pill of 10 by 160, that was about 6.8. And very... Uh, significant difference between these two when you are using the amlodipine in a combination pill. So, uh, uh, again, the, the uh, take-home message, I would say the two numbers to remember, 140 by 90 and 130 by 80, and using a combination pill does help us with the compliance and decrease side effects, and we'll be happy to take any questions. I think me and my worthy panel is here. Thank you. Uh, so, as I said, uh, the current by current uh, guidelines, the main diet that we recommend for hypertensive patients. Now, that does not mean that a hypertensive patient is an isolated hypertensive. You could have ischemic heart disease, could have chronic kidney diseases. Dash diet. Dash diet, as I said, is uh, uh, sodium is 1.5 to 2 grams, and they encourage foods rich in potassium. Actually, the dash diet would recommend foods rich in. Uh, fruits, fiber, grains, and then uh, a high potassium diet uh, as compared to sodium. So as long as you are not shaking sodium chloride, which is our namak on the food, uh, or you are not using too many processed cheese, like Lay's ke chips, which is very much in the food. No, I'm saying that every person should take 2 grams. So how do you कैलकुलेट किस तरह करना है आपके जो खाने में डाल रहा है नमक अगर वो हसबे जायका है तो आप बस वो ले लें ऊपर से उसके ऊपर ना छिड़कें अगर आप कैलकुलेट करने बैठेंगे तो बड़ा मुश्किल है वो तो हांडी सारों ने खानी है वो मासी ने भी खानी है आपने भी खानी है और बच्चों ने भी खानी है आपके कुछ चीजें क्लेरिफाई करने की जरूरत है क्वेश्चन में या मैं कर देता हूं एक आपका क्वेश्चन ये कि इलेक्ट्रोलाइट्स की इंपॉर्टेंस क्या है इन हाइपरटेंशन तो उसकी एक तो ये कि रिमेंबर दिस that hypertension is of two types. One is called V hypertension and the other is called R hypertension. V is the volume related hypertension. When you have excess of volume in the body and that increases the blood volume and that increases blood pressure. The other is R which is renin mediated. R. R is for renin. Okay. So, when you talk about hypertension, you have to reduce both renin and you have to reduce volume so that the patient comes becomes euvolemic if he's already in. So it depends what type of patient you are looking at. If you are looking at a patient with renal compromise or with heart failure, then the, you need to get rid of the extra fluid from that patient because his GFR is low, is not filtering enough. And if he has cardiac failure, he's got less effective arterial blood pressure. Remember the term, effective arterial blood pressure. It's not blood pressure. A cardiac patient will have a 
blood pressure 120 by 80 but it's not effective to produce good perfusion of the kidney resulting in salt and water retention now if you look at the patient with heart failure i'm sorry i'm stepping onto your field yeah, perfectly fine Please but if you are talking about a patient with heart failure you may find his serum sodium to be low but does it mean he's got sodium deficiency no more fluid he's got more fluid in the body he's got dilutional hyponatremia with total body salt excess he's got extra salt in his body but it is dilute will go into that it will go everywhere. everywhere it will go everywhere so uh, you have to see that the sodium metabolism we talked about electrolytes i'm just talking about sodium now the sodium metabolism is always coupled with water metabolism it is never alone so you always look at sodium along with the volume status of that patient if the patient is in volume overload you diurese that patient that's what you do in heart failure patients they have low sodium they have expanded volume you give them diuretics and you restrict their salt intake because now despite the fact that they have hyponatremia you restrict their salt intake and you would give them diuretics so that is one part the other is those patients who have hypervolemia and hypernatremia again you restrict their sodium intake so electrolyte disturbances can be electrolyte disturbances can be of various types particularly sodium and you have to treat according to the patient's comorbidities what does he have and what is the pathophysiologic mechanism responsible for these alterations now coming to potassium now if you have a patient with uh, renal failure and he's got he's not excreting his potassium well then if you give him high potassium diet he is going to end up in hyperkalemia or if you are using drugs which can raise the potassium level like arnes like arbs like ace inhibitors then the potassium will go up so you have to keep be mindful and watchful when you give them aldactone or spironolactone or you give them ace or arbs so from that point of, but a person with normal kidney function with normal gfr if you give high potassium diet that has beneficial effects on controlling blood pressure and lowers the blood pressure uh, that is about potassium and as far as the amount of sodium is concerned the normal diet if it contains 3 gram sodium or more than that and you stop adding extra salt as you said that every food has some salt if you stop adding extra salt then you are down to something like 1.5 to 2 grams you should try to keep your sodium intake to less than 2 grams a day so that means you don't add namak in your that in your uh, dahi you don't add in your other you know things you just take whatever is there but for salan for the curry that we are very fond of you can use little bit of salt so that the whole family as he said ke sabne khana hai ghar mein to wo usme aap usko utme extra salt aap kharbuzon ke upar dal ke ya kheeron pe dal ke ya namak mein usme dal ke raite mein dal ke wo aap mat istemal kare to then you are down with that and uh, these uh, cold drinks that we take they contain lot of salt so we should be mindful of that also that we are taking uh, cold drinks kai log kehte hain ji wo doodh soda peena hai maine i don't know why our community combines uh, milk with uh, soda or soda with milk because it, it, it has no scientific reason it has got it's harmful actually and if it's a kidney patient you end up with more hypertension with more phosphate uh, retention in the body i hope i answer your questions the diagnostic importance of sodium and potassium is there because if you have somebody with hyperaldosteronism or if you have uh, mineralocorticoid excess or steroid excess or if you have renal artery stenosis then the potassium will be low so hypokalemic states with hypertension or with metabolic alkalosis will point towards a secondary cause of hypertension and endocrine hypertension which need to investigate further
अगर तो उनका इंजाइना कंट्रोल्ड है एडिक्वेटली ऑन मेडिकेशन पे तो बिल्कुल ग्रेडेड एक्सरसाइज करनी चाहिए उसका पॉजिटिव रोल है नहीं आपने बड़ा अच्छा सवाल का खुद ही जवाब दिया है आई एग्री कि एक्सरसाइज विल प्रोड्यूस नाइट्रिक ऑक्साइड एंड दैट विल कॉल वेज डिलिटेशन एंड इट विल हेल्प वन थिंग आई वुड लाइक टू एड इज मैनी ऑफ आवर पेशेंट्स हु कम टू अस and they have just first time they have their high blood pressure and they would have some symptoms aur wo attribute karte hain ki mere is waqt ji sar mein dard hai to mujhe blood pressure ho gaya hai to mujhe kuch de हमारे यहाँ पे ये भी प्रॉब्लम है रिमेंबर हाइपरटेंशन इज परसिस्टेंट एलिवेशन इन ब्लड प्रेशर रिमेंबर राइज इन ब्लड प्रेशर इज अ स्ट्रेस रिस्पॉन्स ऑफ द बॉडी एज वेल इफ सम बॉडी हैज हैड इट बिकॉज ऑफ एनी रीजन हिज ब्लड प्रेशर मे ट्रांसिएटली गो अप सो इफ यू हैव टू लेबल सम बॉडी एज हाइपर टेंसिव एज डॉक्टर तैयब महुद्दीन तैयब सैद यू मस्ट यू मस्ट डॉक्यूमेंट and then that it is persistently elevated don't label somebody as hypertensive on a single reading unless patient has high blood pressure with evidence of acute target organ damage so if somebody has evidence of acute target organ damage like hypertensive encephalopathy or things like that hypertensive heart failure those are the patients who would be labeled as hypertensive there and then in all other patients regardless of the blood pressure you need to document that they have high blood pressure and for that you have to plan either frequent opd visits or ambulatory blood pressure monitoring so this is another point that should be kept in mind we have seen people who had high blood pressures just once because of say some even pain in abdomen and somebody put them on anti hypertensives and they ended up in hypotension so remember hypertension is persistently elevated blood pressure and secondly we must also keep in mind when to investigate for secondary causes of hypertension and regarding those the secondary causes of hypertension whenever somebody has early onset of high blood pressure hypertension or late age of onset of hypertension or if somebody has hypertension which is resistant to treatment not responding to three different anti hypertensives combined then you must suspect secondary causes of hypertension as well थैंक यू डॉक्टर असद जैसा कि अभी डॉक्टर तैयब ने भी इस चीज़ पे स्ट्रेस किया कि कम्बिनेशन थेरापी अब इन्होंने एक स्लाइड दिखाई थी जिसमें कि 80 परसेंट ऑफ द पेशेंट दे नीड मोर देन टू मेडिसिन टू कंट्रोल हाइपरटेंशन 2.5 जो एवरेज पे तो इसलिए अर्ली अगर हम कम्बिनेशन पे स्टार्ट करें तो इट्स बेटर और हमने यही देखा है अपने एक्सपीरियंस में भी कि उनका हम जल्दी अचीव कर लेते हैं जो अपना टारगेट है uh, मैं कुछ अर्सा पहले यूके में था आई वाज सरप्राइज टू नो दैट देर आर नो फिक्स डोज कम्बिनेशन अवेलेबल इन यूके हमें वो कहते हैं कि आप कम्बिनेशन दें वहाँ पर कम्बिनेशन अवेलेबल नहीं थी मैं हैरान हुआ वहाँ पर कुछ डॉक्टर्स कुछ रेलेटिव कुछ यंग डॉक्टर्स भी थे तो वहाँ पे वो मैं ये समझ सका कि उनको शायद वो चूँकि एन एच ने जो नेशनल हेल्थ सर्विस है उनको दवाइयाँ फ्री देना होती हैं पेशेंट्स को दे डोंट चार्ज द पेशेंट सारी हेल्थ सर्विस फ्री है तो उनको शायद वो कम्बिनेशन जो है वो ब्रांडेड वो महंगे पड़ते हैं जिसकी वजह से दैट वाज द ओनली फैक्टर जो मुझे समझ आई कि जिसकी वजह से वो नहीं अदरवाइज अब जहाँ पे हम एक गोली दे रहे हैं अब ये एक्स्टोर है को एक्स्टोर है जिसमें तीन दवाइयाँ तो वहाँ पे वो तीन गोलियाँ दे रहे हैं हमारे पास पेशेंट आते रहते हैं यू से अमेरिका यू से अमेरिका में तो अवेलेबल हैं फिक्स रोज कम्बिने तो वो अक्सर जो हैं वो तीन तीन गोलियां ले रहे होते हैं हाइपरटेंशन या अभी कल ही मैंने पेशेंट परसों दो, दो पेशेंट देखे इसी हफ्ते में जो कि यूके से आए हुए थे और दोनों तीन तीन गोलियां ले रहे थे हम उसकी बजाय एक गोली से ए, कर लेते हैं क्योंकि पिछले लास्ट ईयर इन्होंने पीएसआईएम वालों ने ए, कुछ हाइपर पे कोर्स कराए थे डायबिटीज़ पर भी तो एक हमने सुना वहाँ पर मानचेस्टर से थे कोई स्पीकर तो उन्होंने बताया हमें कि द सो कार्ड रेजिस्टेंट हाइपरटेंशन जो है उसमें 30 परसेंट पेशेंट्स वो थे जो नॉन हेडियर टू द ट्रीटमेंट थे तो कम्प्लाइंस बहुत ही ज़रूरी है जैसे अभी एक स्लाइड में भी हमने देखा पेशेंट जो हैं कुछ अरसे बाद दवाई छोड़ देते हैं 
बहुत से पेशेंट्स ऐसे हमने देखे हैं कि जो दवाई छोड़ देते हैं वो समझते हैं कि अब वो चेक कराते हैं जी और क्यों पूछो क्यों छोड़िए तो कहते हैं जी कि ब्लड प्रेशर नॉर्मल था तो हमने छोड़ दी वो तो दवाई जो ले रहे थे उससे नॉर्मल था ना जब जूँ ही छोड़ेंगे तो फिर बढ़ जाएगा इसलिए कंप्लाइंस बहुत ज़रूरी है इसमें एजुकेट करना पेशेंट्स को बहुत ज़रूरी है क्योंकि पेशेंट जो समझते हैं अब ठीक हो गया ब्लड प्रेशर तो दवाई छोड़ देते हैं तो इसमें जो टेक होम मैसेज है नंबर एक तो कम्बिनेशन थेरापी से स्टार्ट करें क्योंकि मोस्टली पेशेंट हमारे जो आते हैं कोई वन सिक्सटी हंड्रेड से यूजली ऊपर होते हैं जिनको दवाई की ज़रूरत होती है और जैसे डॉक्टर असद साहब ने बताया कि उनको चेक कर अलबत् हमें थोड़ी इसमें रेजर्वेशन है पेशेंट्स आते नहीं हैं फॉलोअप के लिए आपने ब्लड प्रेशर चेक किया उसको कहा है कि हफ्ते बाद आएँ तो बहुत कम है जो आएँगे पेशेंट्स को इसलिए हमारी कुछ ये भी प्रॉब्लम्स हैं कि पेशेंट्स फॉलोअप के लिए नहीं हमें कई पेशेंट्स को हमें शुरू में ही अगर काफ़ी ज़्यादा है तो स्टार्ट करना पड़ता है ट्रीटमेंट आल दो जब वो फिर उसके लिए आते हैं तो हमें डोज कम अगर करनी है कम कर देंगे लेकिन ये एक मेजर प्रॉब्लम है पेशेंट्स फॉलोअप के लिए नहीं आते बहुत कम पेशेंट्स हैं जो आते हैं और दवाई छोड़ देते हैं ये हमारी प्रैक्टिकल प्रॉब्लम्स हैं जो कि हमें ये देखना चाहिए और मैं अक्सर कहता हूँ कि हमारे फैमिली फिजिशन अगर दो बीमारियों को कंट्रोल कर लें डायबिटीज़ और हाइपरटेंशन तो हम तकरीबन 50 परसेंट मॉर्टेलिटी रेट जो इनकी कम्प्लिकेशन से होते हैं उसको हम कम कर सकते हैं आई थिंक सो एंड यू विल एग्री विद मी तो इसलिए ज़रूरी है कि हमारे फैमिली फिजिशंस को पता होना चाहिए कि कहाँ से कौन सी दवाई देनी है एक और जो ऑब्जर्वेशन मैंने देखी है कि एस इनिबेटर से कफ का इंसिडेंस हमारी पापुलेशन में ज़्यादा है एज़ कम्पेयर टू वेस्ट हमें कंपनी वाले बताएंगे जी वन परसेंट टू परसेंट इवन जो करंट डायग्नोसिस में भी फोटीन लिखा हुआ है और हमारा अपना एक्सपीरियंस जो है उसमें भी कोई ट्वेंटी थर्टी के दरमियान होगा बहुत से पेशेंट हमने देखा है जो सफ़र करते हैं आप यकीन नहीं करेंगे एक पेशेंट मैंने देखा तीन साल से खांसी कर रहा था और वो एस इनिबेटर पर था उसका एस इनिबेटर बंद किया तो उसकी खांसी ठीक हो गई ये एक मेजर साइड इफ़ेक्ट है इसलिए हम ज़्यादा आजकल वालसाल्टन और जो एमलोडिपिन वाला कम्बिनेशन है ये ज़्यादा यूज़ करते हैं इसमें बहुत कम चांस बहुत रेयर चांसेज हैं ऐसे कम्बली और डोज भी हमने जूँ ही देखा कि हम 10 मिलीग्राम एमलोडिपिन पे जाते हैं तो इंसिडेंस जो एडिमा का है वो ज़्यादा हो जाता है फाइव तक इतना नहीं है फाइव वन फाइव एट्टी के बाद हम यूजली फाइव वन सिक्सटी देते हैं ताकि एमलोडेपिन को ना बढ़ाना पड़े क्योंकि उससे अडीमा के चांसेस बढ़ जाते हैं ये कुछ ऑब्जर्वेशन है जो हम देखते हैं उसमें थैंक यू वेरी गुड क्वेश्चन एक्चुअली यू हैव टू इंडिविजुअलाइज एंड इफ यू स्टार्ट अ पेशेंट विद क्रॉनिक किडनी डिजीज हु इज इन स्टेज वन और टू और थ्री इवन जनरली दे डोंट गेट प्रॉब्लम्स बट वेन एवर यू स्टार्ट अ पेशेंट on ACE inhibitor or NIRB it is mandatory to do a baseline potassium and a baseline creatinine and if you see an increase in these values to over 20 to 25% previously they used to say 30% then you should withdraw it patients who are in stage 4 or 5 if you give them ACE inhibitor or NIRB to start with then they can drop their gfr and become dialysis dependent but sometimes in in uh, ckd5 or or dialysis patients you can continue to give them if they do not develop hyperkalemia because of the other advantages that ac inhibitors and arbs have in other organs because you know that these uh, receptors are present not only in the kidney but they are also present in the brain in the uterus in the blood vessels in the heart everywhere they are present so if a patient has heart failure as well as end stage kidney disease and is on dialysis and you want to give ac inhibitor or arb for the ventricular remodeling for the heart 
you can continue to do so provided patient does not have hyperkalemia. So the only precaution would be whenever you start at whatever GFR stage or CKD stage you start, you monitor the patient's potassium and creatinine and if you find a decline of more than 20 to 30 percent from baseline, for example, you started at a creatinine of 1 and after two weeks the patient's creatinine is 1.4, what does it mean? It means 40 percent decrease in the uh, GFR, so that this patient is likely to go into further progression because it, is, it depends that how his renal blood vessels are behaving. If it is a unilateral renal artery stenosis, blood pressure is not being controlled, you give ACE inhibitor ARB, excellent. <laughs> but if it is bilateral, then it is likely to worsen the things because of the selective efferent arteriolar vasodilatation that will occur because of ACE and ARBs. But the advantages of ACE inhibitors and ARBs are quite a lot in terms of they will uh, vasodilate the efferent arteriole in the glomerulus and improve the blood flow. So if there were less glomeruli perfused, you may have more glomeruli perfused. It's just like, you know, uh, if a heart rate is 110 and you give a beta blocker, you bring it down to 60 so that the life of the heart is prolonged and the coronary artery disease doesn't uh, get worse. Similarly, if you reduce the GFR, particularly in diabetics, who have a, to start with, they have a high GFR. When a patient becomes diabetic, is generally, generally his GFR is more than normal. It is 120, 130 or 100. Or if you bring it down by 20% to 80, the life of his kidney is prolonged. So, so the, the, to, to answer your question in brief is that whenever you start, don't start it at, at CKD 4 or 5 because you may end up with problems, but a CKD 2 or 3 or 1 if you start and if you don't see an increase in creatinine or a decrease in GFR of more than 20%, you might as well continue with it and with a caution of potassium intake. Many a time patient comes to you and when you ask them about their expected targets, they don't know about it. This happens with us regarding diabetes, regarding blood pressure. So that is the point where we have to educate them. So, maybe. I <laughs> have <laughs> Just oh, doctor ne MBBS kiya hua hai. I don't think he will say that 120 diastolic is 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 that's Except how it is in you should. At least if he is unable to manage that or bring it down, he should refer that patient to a hypertension specialist. Bazo patient apni shame se bachne ke liye bhi kaha tha. Wo doctor ne kaha tha, thik hai. Renal disease can cause blood pressure due to two reasons. One is renal vascular disease that either the renal arteries are compromised, narrowed at the ostium or there is uh, fibromuscular dysplasia as in young females or any segmental branch is severely stenosed and you can get renin and you can get blood pressure. So this is called renovascular hypertension. The other is renal parenchymal disease. So anything that produces a damage to the renal parenchyma whether it is stone and chronic pyelonephritis or it is glomalonephritis or it is some other uh, damage to the renal parenchyma, again, you will have some degree of hypertension. So if the patient has stones, it is, you have to see what is causing the stones. Sometimes there is hypercalcemia. And when we were talking about electrolytes, remember that hypercalcemia produces hypercalcemic nephropathy it produces hypertension. One of the causes of hypertension is hyperparathyroidism in which you get hypercalcemia. So you have to, that's why the calcium channel blockers, when they vasodilate, they block the entry of calcium into the T-tubules of the muscles of the blood vessels. 
So that is how you have to look at this patient, particular patient. If the stones are causing obstruction, they are damaging the parenchyma, if they are causing infection, they can easily give rise to hypertension. Thank you, Professor. I have shown you a slide mein tha ke that you have to treat the highest value above the range. Hogi, aapne usko treat karna hai. So I would still, these patients will be very, um, very much benefited from lifestyle modification. Because it will not happen there is a drug which is specifically would target the diastolic blood pressure alone. But yes, in real life, you see some females that do show up with very kind of a very isolated diastolic hypertension. There is some data to suggest that calcium channel blockers may fare better for these patients. But I have not come across that guidelines may be specific for this. But if there is such a borderline number that 110 is 90, and you know that if you give the drug, then the upper will be 100 and the lower will be 80. So I think you should shave off the number from the top to the bottom, from the risk profile to the top to the risk profile. So I think diet and exercise and these things will benefit a lot, at least the number that you have mentioned, 110. So I think diet and exercise and these things will benefit a lot, at least the number that you have mentioned, 110. बाय 90 हाँ अगर कोई नंबर 110 बटा 100 इस टाइप का नंबर आ जाता है वो फिर एक और बात है what I have seen in our population is their diastolic people who have only diastolic blood pressure high they actually have some stress going on तो आप उनको उसमें स्ट्रेस को इवैल्यूएट करें एंड मे बी बीटा ब्लॉकर्स कैन हेल्प देम मतलब नॉट हाई डोजेज ऑफ बीटा ब्लॉकर स्मॉल डोजेज ऑफ बीटा ब्लॉकर्स डू हेल्प देम दिस इज माय ऑब्जर्वेशन देर इज नो स्टडी बट आइसोलेटेड डायस्टोलिक राइज इन ब्लड प्रेशर मोस्टली इज ड्यू टू स्ट्रेस एंड इफ इट इज आइसोलेटेड सिस्टोलिक हाइपरटेंशन वो तो रिकोगनाइज एंटिटी है एंड दैट इज बिकॉज ऑफ एथ्रोसिक्लोरोसिस एंड मोस्टली इन ओल्डर पीपल गाइडलाइंस आपके हो सकता है बीपी की रेंज को चेंज कर दें बट फॉर द मोस्ट पार्ट आपके एजेंट्स वो ही चार ही हैं ए से आर बी कैल्शियम चैनल ब्लॉकर और थाइजा डायोरेटिक्स एज जी जी मैं एज की कह रहा हूँ कि उसमें एज में हो सकता है कि आपका ब्लड प्रेशर गोल पे फर्क डाल जाए एजेंट पे कोई इतना फर्क नहीं डालेगा ऑफ कोर्स एक पेशेंट है एल्डरली है उसको बीपी एच है तो आप उसको डायोरेटिक ना दें वो जैसे जैसे सर ने कहा अगर इतना यंग पेशेंट आ रहा है तो ही हैज टू बी वर्कड अप फॉर सेकेंडरी हाइपरटेंशन सो ब्लड प्रेशर तो आप कंट्रोल करेंगे उसको रेजिस्टेंट हाइपरटेंशन की जो उन्होंने डेफिनेशन बताई तीन कई जो किताबों में चार लिखी हुई हैं एंड वन एजेंट शुड बी अ डायोरेटिक टू क्लासीफाई एज बट If you see a patient like this, who's 25 year old young male with 180 by 110, or कोई उसने कोकेन या कोई ऐसी ड्रग की हिस्ट्री नहीं है उसकी ये, तो he has to be worked up for secondary hypertension. It'll be disfavor if you don't. You can at least to start with, जैसे डॉक्टर जासमन ने कहा, उसके इलेक्ट्रोलाइट ही करा लें, आपको सोडियम पोटेशियम से ही बड़ा अंदाज़ा हो जाएगा कि उसका रीनोवैस्कुलर स्टेटस कैसा है, पोटेशियम कम है, ज उसमें यूजुअली आप रेनिन एल्डोस्टीरोन और यूरिन मेटानेफ्रिंस चुकताई लैब 24 आवर के करते हैं रीनल आर्टरी डॉपलर आप करवा सकते हैं ये कुछ मोटे मोटे चीदा टेस्ट हैं जो आप करवा सकते हैं प्रेगनेंसी में भी जरा बताइए कि क्योंकि एस इनिबेटर एआर भी तो कंट्राइंडिकेटेड है हमें कौन सी प्रेफरेम देनी चाहिए मेडिसिन मैं पहले इनके जवाब दूँ हाँ दूसरा ये जो है ना आपका क्वेश्चन के ट्वेंटी से थर्टी थर्टी से फोर्टी तो उसमें गाइडलाइन यही है लेस देन फिफ्टी फाइव और उसमें बेशक 18 हो 20 हो 25 हो वो लेस देन 55 की और है विद कंपेलिंग इंडिकेशन और है अब 55 और है तो वो रिमेंस द सेम उस पे एज से इतना फर्क नहीं पड़ता डॉक्टर चीमा साहब ने कहा है जी प्रेगनेंसी में हाइपरटेंशन का क्या है तो इट्स अ वेरी रेलेवेंट एक्चुअली क्वेश्चन एंड आई इनिशियली थॉट अबाउट आई हैड अ फुल टॉक ऑन इट एक्चुअली कि मैं उसको ऐड करूं बट दैट्स अ होल डिफरेंट टॉपिक फॉर इट सो अभी जो अमेरिकन कॉलेज ऑफ गैस्ट्रोएंट्रोलॉजी है या उनकी मेजॉरिटी जो है सोसाइटीज़ वो अब लबेटा लॉल इज़ द नंबर वन एजेंट एल्डोमेट इज नॉट मिथाइल डोपा इज नॉट द नंबर वन एजेंट सो येस इट्स अ नॉन सेलेक्टिव बेटा इट्स एल्फा ब्लॉकर ऑल्सो इट्स नॉट ओनली बेटा ब्लॉक सो या सो लबेटा लॉल इज योर नंबर वन चॉइस नाउ एंड दे वुड बी क्लासिफाइड एज अ हाई रिस्क पेशेंट एक्चुअली द गोल शुड बी वन थर्टी बाई एटी और इवन लेस क्योंकि प्लेसेंटल परफ्यूजन के लिए आपको ब्लड प्रेशर कंट्रोल इज वेरी वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट 
सो so, डेफिनेशन हमें पता है ये लास्ट सेमेस्टर में या छः माह बाद डिलीवरी के बाद हो वो इतना हमारे लिए रेलिवेंट नहीं है हमने तो कंट्रोल करना है ब्लड प्रेशर को और अगर वो औरत दोबारा प्रेगनेंट होती है तो उसको बताने के चांसेस अगर वो नॉर्मल भी होगी है तो इस दफ़ा चांस फिफ्टी परसेंट ज़्यादा हो जाएगा दोबारा हाइपर डेवलप होने का सो वन टेक होम मैसेज टू टेक इज लबेटल ऑल इज योर आइडियल ड्रग टू टेक ए सिनेबेटर एंड ए आर बीज आर नॉट रिकमेंडेड बिकॉज टेक्निकली कॉन्ट्रा इंडिकेटेड एज प्रेगनेंसी ये फिर प्रेगनेंसी की बात कर रहे हैं जाहिर है वो चाइल्ड बेरिंग एज की बात कर रहे हैं नहीं वो तो सर जब बीपी हाई हो जाएगा औरत का वो क्रॉस कर गया लेट से उसका 140 बटा नब्बे से ज़्यादा परसिस्टेंटली आ रहा है वो वॉक भी कर रही है खुराक में भी उसने नमक कम रखा हुआ है आपकी कुछ रीडिंग्स ज़्यादा आ गई दो हफ्ते में घर में गाहे बगाहे चेक किया तो यू शुड जस्ट स्टार्ट लबेटा लॉल एट दैट टाइम लबेटा लॉल सौ मिलीग्राम की गोली पाकिस्तान में आती है अनफॉर्चुनेटली और इसकी मैक्सिमम डोज चौबीस मिलीग्राम है चौबीस घंटे में और यूजली आप आठ घंटे बाद एक गोली लेते हैं नहीं सर ये लबेटा लॉल के ही नाम से आती है मुझे नहीं पता कौन सी कंपनी बनाती है बट अमेरिका में भी इसकी 300 मिलीग्राम से ज़्यादा की गोली नहीं बनती थी अनफॉर्चुनेटली सो इशू इज़ द पिल काउंट इज़ अ बिग इशू 130 थर्टी बाई एटी अच्छा मिनिमम यू शुड बी लेस दैन वन थर्टी बाई एटी नहीं 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 उससे नहीं इतना फ़र्क डलता है मैंने पूछा था गायना कॉलेज से तो उन्होंने कहा था नहीं उसका बल्कि वो एक्चुअली देर इज़ अ डेटा टू सजेस्ट इफ यू गिव लो प्रेन इट हेल्प्स विद प्लेसेंटल परफ्यूजन वो कहते हैं एसिटाइल साली साल एक एसिड का बट मैंने आस गायना कॉलेज हमारा कोई डेटा नहीं है फ्राम कार्डिय स्टैंड पॉइंट दैट इट मेक्स एनी डिफरेंस येस द गायना कॉलेज बट इट्स ऑल प्लेसेंटल परफ्यूजन डेटा दर इज नो कार्डियो वैस्कुलर बेनिफिट फ्राम आर स्टैंड पॉइंट इट्स अपर को एगेबल स्टेट प्रेगनेंसी बट यू जिस प्रिस्क्राइब लोप्रिन टू एवरीबडी बट वो ज्यादा उनका प्लेसेंटल प्रफ्यूजन का इसके अंदर डेटा है दूसरा सर ने जैसे एस और ए आर बी का कहा एल्डोमेट एक और एजेंट है हाइड्रोलजीन एक और एजेंट है जो आप प्रेगनेंसी में दे सकते हैं नॉट रिकमेंडेड दैट वेल सारे वही सी क्लास में आते हैं सर में डिपेंड करता है कि आप हाइपर टेंशन जब प्रेगनेंसी में देखते हैं तो फर्स्ट ट्राइमेस्टर में जो हाइपरटेंशन है ना इट इज़ नॉट बिकॉज ऑफ प्रेगनेंसी इंड्यूस्ड हाइपरटेंशन हाइपरटेंशन जो प्रेगनेंसी की वजह से होती है वो यूजुअली ट्वेंटी वीक के बाद होती है और उसमें पेशेंट को एडिमा भी होता है प्रोटीन यूरिया भी होता है जो प्रेगनेंसी इंड्यूस्ड हाइपरटेंशन है जिसको प्री एक्लेम्शिया कहते हैं डिस्पाइट एडिमा दे आर इंट्रावेस्कुलरली वॉल्यूम कंट्रैक्टेड उनमें डायूरेटिक्स भी नहीं देने चाहिए अगरचे उनको एडीमा है चूँकि दैट विल रिड्यूस देयर रीनल प्लेसेंटल ब्लड फ्लो और इसलिए तो अगर एक यंग फीमेल है और वो उसको फर्स्ट ट्रेमेस्टर में हाइपर टेंशन है तो लुक फॉर अ सेकेंडरी कॉज बिकॉज 20 साल की 22 साल की बच्ची है और वो उसको फर्स्ट ट्रेमेस्टर में हाइपर टेंशन हो गई है इट्स नॉट बिकॉज ऑफ प्रेगनेंसी इट हैज़ टू बी सम अंडरलाइंग रीनल डिजीज गोइंग ऑन वी सी लॉट ऑफ पेशेंट्स वो कम टू अस Uh, with this problem and they are pregnant and they have developed hypertension before 20th week and they do not have other features so we have to look for a renal cause or a renovascular cause which is or an endocrine cause for hypertension rarely essential hypertension will come in that age uh, uh, in a young female ji wohi main jo bata raha tha this is what i was pointing out i see i'm i'm a physician so i see patients who are having hypertension gi disorders as well so there are many patients who if they have acid peptic disorder their blood pressure goes up transiently and if you do not appropriately diagnose them you may end up in prescribing then uh, them anti hypertensives this is what i told you initially those are the patients who have apd related symptoms if they take these things like that wo pani bhi piyenge ya usme seven up mein mila ke piyenge unki gas has khatam ho to their blood pressure would come down so that could be the explanation if something like this happens investigate or take history examine them for acid peptic disorder it's not the egg it's the salt with the egg that people consume so anda is a universal food that's usually consumed with the salt सो so, पाकिस्तान में बड़ा कॉमन है कि वो कहते हैं जी मैंने अंडा खा लिया सो इट्स एसेंशियली द सॉल्ट विद द एग दैट कॉजेज द ब्लड प्रेशर टू गो अप हाँ आप ओ आर एस पी सकते हैं अगर कोई इस टाइप का है कि पेशेंट सिम्टोमेटिक है उसको चक्कर आ रहे हैं तो ऑफ कोर्स यू कैन हैव अ ओ आर एस और हैव अ लिटल सॉल्टी पैकेट ऑफ चिप्स और समथिंग लाइक दैट दैट विल डेफिनेटली इंक्रीज द ब्लड प्रेशर बट देन यू मस्ट फाइंड द कॉज फॉर इट इफ पेशेंट हैज हाइपोटेंशन यू मस्ट ट्राई टू फाइंड द कॉज फॉर इट 
and remember whatever patient tells you you must take the history based on symptoms and make your diagnosis based on symptoms and there make your own impression forget whatever patient says mera blood pressure high ho gaya ya low ho gaya don't be misled by their this statement ask them what are your symptoms what are you feeling and according to differential diagnosis make your own diagnosis ha uh, ek main aur cheez point out karna cha raha tha ke चूँकि हाइपर टेंशन और डायबिटीज़ के मोस्टली पेशेंट्स में कोई सिम्टम्स नहीं होते इसलिए ज़रूरी है कि कोई भी पेशेंट आपको अगर आपके पास बहुत ज़्यादा रश नहीं है टाइम है तो इस्पेली कोई फोर्टीज या इसके आते हैं उसके बाद आते हैं पेशेंट तो यू मस्ट चेक देर ब्लड प्रेशर एंड इफ पॉसिबल शुगर एल्स वेल क्योंकि उनके कोई सिम्टम नहीं पेशेंट तभी आएगा जब उसको कोई कॉम्प्लिकेशन होगी उसको चूंकि सिम्टम्स कोई नहीं है वो समझते हैं हमें कुछ नहीं और इसीलिए दवाई भी छोड़ देते हैं पेशेंट कि चूंकि हमें कोई प्रॉब्लम नहीं है कोई सिम्टम नहीं है हम क्यों दवाई खाएं तो इसलिए जो भी पेशेंट आता है एटलीस्ट उसका कुछ अरसे में साल में छः महीने में एक दफ़ा ब्लड प्रेशर और शुगर चेक होनी चाहिए जो भी पेशेंट्स आते हैं इस्पेशली अंदर फोर्टीज फिफ्टीज जी बताइए देखिए पाकिस्तान में तो फिल वक्त एल्डेक्टोन और एप्लेनॉन ही अवेलेबल हैं जो दो यूज़ होती हैं और वो हाइपरटेंशन में हम ज़्यादा नहीं बहुत ज़्यादा यूज़ करते कोई कौन सिंड्रोम वगैरह टाइप उस टाइप का कोई पेशेंट हो तो वो आकी तो आई वी कैन लोकेट अप फॉर यू बट वी आर आई एम नॉट फेमिलियर विद इट ठीक है वाम के भरपूर पे इसरार पे अब ये फोर ग्राम सोडियम वाला खाना खोल देना चाहिए